The Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by BetaShares, serving over 1 million investors across Australia's broadest range of ETFs. After years of record low interest rates, income-seeking investors have been returning to cash and fixed income ETFs, drawn by the attractive returns on offer. Equity income funds have also been generating healthy income streams. BetaShares provides yield-hungry investors with a range of income-focused funds to choose from, including ETFs offering exposure to cash, bonds, hybrids, Australian shares, and international shares. To explore the BetaShares ETF range, visit betashares.com.au and consider if the fund is right for you. I'm also proud to say that this episode of the Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by The Intelligent Investor, Australia's premier investment research membership service. You can get a free trial for 15 days, no credit card details required. To access the insights of some of Australia's best analysts, including buy, hold, and sell share recommendations, click the link in your podcast player to secure your Intelligent Investor membership today. Hey there, here's a quick note. This podcast contains general financial advice only. That means it's not specific to you, your needs, goals, or objectives. So don't act on the information until you've spoken with your financial advisor. You'll find our full disclosure, disclaimer, and link to our financial services guide in the show notes. Drew Meredith, welcome to the finale of the Australian Investors Podcast reporting season. How are you, mate? Pretty good. I might yeah, might miss you for a few weeks or a few months. Yeah, who knows? Maybe we'll come back in 2023 and look at how good um, healthcare has done and how bad resources have done. Maybe we'll <laughs> put on a different hat. Um, but seriously, if if you're listening to this and you've, what, you've listened through reporting season, thanks so much for tuning in every week as we went through these companies. We've got another 10 for you today. Um, I've got one doozy. So like, four decent results and one dog um, for just to mix it up a bit. Uh, and if you want to send us your questions, I know some of you have sent questions in for companies for us to cover, please send them to us. If you have questions on financial planning, portfolio construction, whatever, uh, you'll find a link in the show notes. It goes to a type form. It's like a online survey. You can fill out the question anonymous. Uh, and also you can, or you can use a, a, a fun name. I've got a few names already. Uh, sent through, which are a bit creative. So send your questions in. Drew and I will try and answer them on the show uh, and we'll have a bit of fun doing so. So Drew, uh, a few weeks ago, we went a bit over time, mate. So maybe today what we'll try and do is keep it to a few minutes for each company. Good luck. Yeah, here we go. Um, <laughs> don't get me started on one of them. So <laughs> um, I, reckon we can just, I reckon we can just crack on, mate. So uh, you've got a few blue chips, as you like to say, keep it nice and boring. Um, but there are actually really interesting companies. So maybe definitely. Do you want to uh, do you want to um, kick us off? Yeah, definitely. And I mean, I said, it is pretty boring, but uh, uh, we probably talked in the past. The reason we we're always looking at the blue chips is because our our clients are predominantly retired. So yeah, or you know, seeking consistent returns and less so worried about you know significant growth. So first one up, boring but super interesting at the same time is Ramsey Healthcare. Uh, so one of the biggest, uh, the biggest private hospital operator in Australia, and expanding mm. pretty heavily overseas uh, at the same time. So they own, uh, host, they do work and own hospitals in the UK and in France, and as well. There's a kind of a, an interesting backdrop to this one because KKR, the private equity firm, lobbed a bid for them. Uh, it was almost 12 months ago now, I think. Oh uh, yeah, I was looking at the yeah. chart just now, and I've seen this massive spike. That's what. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So the bid, there's a bid sitting there at eighty eight dollars per share, and I think a big play on that is the property that they that they own. Obviously, they own quite a few hospitals as well as operate them. Mm-hmm. So the eighty eight dollar a share bid, and that was kind of hanging over the report. Um, the report wasn't particularly good or bad. Uh, and then KKR essentially, because the French hospitals are owned by I think another private equity firm, they could never get due diligence rights to look closely at those assets. Um, mm. So KKR has restructured the deal, still offering retail shareholders or anyone with un- under like $5 million worth of shares, um, $88, but everyone else would have to receive shares in that. It's Ramsey DeSante, it's called. Um, but I mean, if there's an industry that's been hit more by COVID, it was probably health, private healthcare. So elective surgeries cut, basically uh, leaving facilities open or leasing facilities to you know the public um system to help out with treatment uh so not a 
not a great result, but it could be a lot worse. Revenue up 3.1%, earnings down 20, profit down 40, but still made 274 million. And then the dividend was cut by 50%, essentially because you get less cash flow coming in. So you're keeping your payout ratio mm. at the same rate. Um, I think relevance is something like nine months of lockdowns during the financial year. Yeah, well, that'll do it. Um, even elective surgery cuts. So, um, uh, and then probably the more interesting thing more recently is they've spent about two point seven billion. So they expand the mix or in change the rooms or buy new hospitals or do greenfield or brownfield developments. Um and then there was a bit of press around them cancelling their deal with Bupa, the private health insurer. So they have to have agreements for treatment with all the health insurers and then renegotiating it. So just telling you that there's some pressure on costs and they're they're using their position to kind of negotiate back. Hmm. So it's um it's, it, I mean, Ramsey's one of these companies that has just grown like clockwork each and every year. It seems like that deal would be pretty palatable because the shares are trading at around about $71. Exactly. So it's hard to sell at that price when you know there's an eight, and there's still an offer. They don't like the new offer, but it's still an offer at 88 bucks. That's, um, mm. okay, interesting. I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, there's a few different ways to cut it, but I would, you know, I, I've, I know people personally who have held Ramsey shares for an incredibly long period of time and have done so well out of owning them. They would probably be disappointed to sell, to be honest, because they're receiving dividends and, you know, the business has grown very well since they've they've bought it. So um, I guess either way you look at it, you're probably getting a a pretty, like you're in a pretty good spot if you're a long-term holder of Ramsey shares. Um, Do many of your clients own it? Most. Yeah, yeah, so it's in our model. One of <clears throat> I don't own it personally, but it's in our model. Yeah, right. Okay. Uh, and so, would you do you have a view on the takeover? Like, do you think it's good value, or do you think it's you know worth you know even if it doesn't go through? Like, what what what's your general view on it? I guess I think it's pretty good value the the takeover. So if it was trading close to that, you'd you'd definitely be comfortable. The problem then is where do you deploy it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. Uh, it's a pretty smart private equity firm, so I'm sure there's additional upside there. It'd be interesting to see what happened if they didn't have to shut down all their operations for two years and where the share price would have been then. Yeah, um, true. Because backing this, you've got a you know they, everyone says the aging demographic, but you've got massive lineup of you know non elect or elective surgery, non elective surgery, and the public health system in Australia is struggling to to remain well staffed, and so it's naturally got this tailwind. Uh, I think as an industry and a sector. So mm. that's why we initially liked it. So would you, okay. So maybe putting you on the spot here, would you buy it today? Yep. Yeah. 71, $71. You've got that, I guess that option of getting, get, getting taken over at effectively $88. Unless you're or worried you, about another lockdown. I don't think we're getting any more of them. So yeah. Okay, cool. I like it. Uh, uh, it's RHC is a ticker symbol for Ramsey healthcare on the ASX, uh, maybe I'll kick off with another uh, related ticker, which is RPM Global. This trades under the ticker symbol RUL. Please don't get confused with RPM. That's an automotive company. I'm not talking about an automotive company. Um, RPM Global is a business that's involved in software for mining companies, particularly coal, but also copper and other types of businesses. And the software is used for simulation of mines. It's used for um, like asset maintenance. So say where where trucks drive on a mine site, wear and tear, those types of things. Um, The big story, and people will know that I've followed this company for a very long time, uh, the big story with RPM Global is since 2012, current CEO Richard Matthews has been at the helm and really kind of augmented the business to focus most of its attention on its software division, which if you look at the operating level has always been profitable. It's the advisory business, the consulting side of its business, which has often been at the whim of commodity prices and the cycle. And that's where it's been dragged down on the unit economics aren't nearly as compelling. But there's also something else going on within the software division itself. Uh, There's actually three things. Um, The business itself has gone from perpetual licenses, so selling one-off tickets for software, to actually selling it um, on a subscription. And the next thing is that it's actually moved all of its software, and this has just been completed, moved all of its software modules to the cloud. And then the third thing, which is happening soon, is the shift towards a SaaS-based model. 
Um, so once you go to SaaS, then you can have, you know, revenue uplift from increases of prices. You know, it's very easy to add on modules. Through scale. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so what we've seen over the last probably three years in particular is the business shift the mix from not just perpetual, um, but to subscription. So we've seen it kind of phase out that perpetual licensing and the business has grown it, the business has done a very good job of transitioning what is normally a very hard period. So through that period, because what happens is you typically receive a lot of the cash up front for perpetual licenses. It looks good, um, but it's basically gone now entirely to subscriptions. So for RPM Global shareholders, it's actually it's actually it's well done for sticking through it basically and um, holding onto your shares through this process. If you look in the there's one slide that I'll call out from the. Uh, results and I'll just get to them in a second is that there's a slide in there where it's it's it shows you the new product adoption RPM has been rolling out more and more products or modules for different types of mining for different products and services um, and if you look at this new product adoption chart it actually shows you that the business like customers have there's probably about 60 different companies that have taken on additional modules or additional products within the, the lineup so it tells you that existing customers and new customers are taking on more um and so just in terms of the the top line sales uh, 84 million dollars up 20 percent software was up 14 percent with the shift to subscription so subscription revenue was up 69 percent the advisory revenue growth um came in at 48 percent and interestingly, because of where we are in the cycle uh, being very positive for resources at the moment, they've got six months of work already booked, basically. So they're six months ahead of time, which is pretty good. There are times when the advisory division is the opposite way around or maybe not the opposite way, but it struggles. Uh, profitability, it actually reported a loss of $4 million. That's, a, that's an improvement, but it's still a loss. So keep that in mind. There's a strong uh, contribution from the software and the advisory business. So the advisory business, because of the cycle again um, and the shift towards ESG consulting um, has actually had an uplift there. It's doing still doing a buyback, which has continued post-reporting season. Um, and for the first time, uh, the company, at least I think it's the first time as far as I know, has given guidance. Uh, and they said that's because we've got, you know, we've got clarity on our subscriptions now. We can forecast. And they've said they expect to report about $101 million of revenue, which is signaling 20% growth, and EBITDA of around $14.2 million, which would be over 200% growth. So the quote was, uh, and this is the quote, with a rock solid revenue foundation now in place, we expect a major revenue growth uptick and margin expansion, end quote. So pretty bullish outlook from RPM Global. Um, the business uh, the, itself, In an sorry, environment where everyone's trying to extract efficiency. So they do like planning. And uh, I think one of the big ones I just saw is emissions manager and sustainable technology. So understanding what you're emitting and reporting that to authorities mm. is becoming more and more important. So uh, having a tool, as you said, if they're selling it, multiple things to the same uh, buyers or clients, then it would suggest that they're doing something right and they're in the right yeah. area and niche. Yeah, they are. There's a, there's another company on the ASX called Imdex, which is expanding outside of the exploration uh, software, which is where it typically operates. And that's growing in this space as well. And so I think RPM, like it's been sold down recently. And I think the company, while shares aren't super cheap, and I don't think they ever will be because now it's shifting to a higher quality business, I think for a small position in a portfolio, given that it is kind of a small cap, um, I think it's I think it's worthy of a small spot in a portfolio at today's prices. Uh, just given that outlook of subscription revenue, the company has to deliver over the next few years, but um, it's a very high quality business with a really good management team at the helm. So um that's rpm global r-u-l it's a ticker symbol i'd follow that with the next one which is west farmers you'd say quality management and yeah, quality definitely. business too again super boring um so actually i think i sold it as the most interesting company on the asx last time <laughs> this is it has <laughs> battery tech it has online sales it picks up 30 cents in every dollar it's like an oligopoly in terms of uh i oh know it's not coals anymore sorry yeah it's a monopoly in terms of bunnings and office works pretty strong too um i think the challenge we saw it with coals and woolies last week with west farmers is that um comparable so the mm -hmm. devil of comparable when you did incredibly well a year before uh so i said solid but not not fantastic mm -hmm. um 
revenue was up eight and a half percent, but excluding the pharmaceutical business they bought last year in a bit of a bidding war, it was only up four point nine, which is probably slow for West Farmers. Profit fell one percent, two point three billion, uh, and operating cash flow fell as well. So the dividend barely increased. Um, yeah, and the, I think one of the highlights was though I said the second half profit growth was significantly stronger, like thirteen hmm. percent. Um, but the uh, they also own Kmart, which has been a for some reason among the hardest hit of the retailers and department stores um, during the pandemic. Which I, I yeah, I mean, I have never bought anything online from Kmart, but um, in person, it always seems to be busy. All the Kmart's that I go to, at least the ones that have like got the new branding and look good, and um, surprising. Definitely. Yeah, I think there's some more comp- competition from the big W's and the targets. And uh, I think we spoke on a few other times about inventory yeah. as well. So I think Kmart might have had issues in actually getting inventory. Um, I think a lot of it came from China originally, yeah. so where some people had too much inventory, not having enough, and you know, you're kind of stuck. But really, I mean, you look at the size of the business on a, a earnings basis, Two point two billion comes from Bunnings, and three point out of a total of uh, three point four. Yeah. So you're like, really, it's two thirds Bunnings. Does it really matter? Yep. What Kmart's doing in there, um, and it's similar for uh, the next. Yeah, it goes Kmart next, and then the fertilizer and other divisions. So very much a play on Bunnings. Yeah. Um, it's it's strong business, right? Like I, I always look at uh, West Farmers and think, yeah, it's it's strong. For in a blue chip portfolio, fully frank dividends, uh, it's pretty hard to go past it. Um, you pay a reasonable price for it, which is mm. always a challenge because it's you always pay more for a monopoly. True. Do you think it's like? Do you think it's worth today's price? Like, do you think, or do you think it's worthy of a spot in portfolios? I do. Yeah, for this, maybe not sixty bucks where it was uh, to begin the year. Everything yeah. was at at highs back then. And you kind of see within a portfolio, you want multiple uh, styles or different types of companies. So West Farmers being a staple or a center, that's, that's it's actually considered a, re, uh, a retail or yeah. sorry, discretionary stock, but a staple. You want these kind of companies are the ones people go to when volatility increases and the tech sector and the mining sector are struggling. They'll move to Woolworths and West Farmers mm. um, and kind of the boring companies. Yeah, it it, it, um, it was trading on you know two times sales, which is pretty high for a very mature, as you said, discretionally retail business. Now it's you know about down to one point three times sales. This is a very crude metric, but um, you know it's I guess yeah, it was it kind of got a bit of ahead of itself, uh, particularly now it's cycling out of those comps. Um, one of the things is that when you get squeezed on operating cash flows, when you've got the margin like they do. The, the free cash flows, once you subtract capital expenditure, uh, it really takes a crunch. The free cash flow went from $2.7 billion to $1.1. So quite a step yeah. change there. Yeah, um, yeah I, I like the business, to be honest. I always thought that, um, you know, the, the having it coals with it was a good was a good business. But um, even by itself, it's capable of growth. And once we cycle out of these COVID comps, Bunnings should be ticking along nicely, as usual. You want to buy it when no one else wants it. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably now. Yeah, which yeah, that's it. Because you don't get, like you said, you don't get a chance to buy a high quality company, let alone an oligopoly, um, you know, at, at compelling prices. All right, cool. I like it, man. I like it. Um, I'll 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 shift gears uh, to A2 Milk, which is uh, the A2 only protein dairy company. So the company has operations in China and Asia. Uh, it's got a small business in the United States, which is growing, but it's quite small. It's not profitable. And it's obviously got the Australian business too. Um, I covered this company for Self Wealth Live on Wednesday night. For anyone that wants to dive into that, I went into a bit more detail there. But uh, last few years, it's been a bit of a volatile ride for A2 Milk shareholders. And long-time listeners will know that I had a bet with uh, Nirban Mahanti. Never bet. Uh, never bet. And uh, the bet was that if Penfolds got taken out, I would get a bottle of Penfolds and if A2 Milk got taken over, he would get a bottle of A2 Milk. <laughs> it was a pretty good deal for me and I still think it's alive and well. So, Nirban, if you're listening. Um, but the company has been sold down. Uh, in 2020, share price got as high as around 20 bucks, uh, now down to around like $5.70. So, 
a big retraction from A2 milk. And there are a few reasons for this COVID interruptions in the supply chain, but also um, like a lot of tit for tat between Australia and China at the time. Um, and so A2 milk relied on the suitcase trade, getting infant formula tins over to China, you know, buy it here on the shelves from Woolies. I've, I've heard rumors that some chemist warehouse have post office attached to them. Um, so they could basically stock and sell straight uh, post it straight away to China. Um, and so that that kind of frantic behavior has kind of come and gone. Uh, A2 Milk had a bit of an inventory problem and they've cycled out of that, which is positive. Sales up 20%. If you exclude the Matura Valley, which is, I'll get to that in a second, it's a um, manufacturing site that A2 Milk has bought. Um, it's Sales are up 11%, 25% growth in China. Um, it went backwards in Australia. And the USA is around about $82 million of revenue. So if you compare that to um, the overall business at $1.4 billion, you get a sense of how small it is. Net profit, $123 million. That was up 52%. That was because of that big expansion in revenue. Um, there's still a meaningful increase in things like marketing expenses, but the huge increase in revenue propelled the result. Uh, they're doing a $150 million buyback, but they've got $816 million of cash, net cash on their balance sheet. So pretty rock solid balance sheet, um, able to afford that buyback, no worries at all. Top uh, performer in the last few weeks, hasn't it? It's Has it? Okay. When I write my daily update, it seems to be going up when everything else is going down. So Yeah, right. right. It, well, yeah, it has it has come back from a low recently, around about four bucks. So if you think about that, four bucks, when was that? That was uh, you know May this year, and now 50%. it's up. Yeah, so it's it's really bounced back, and I think that's just that China story. To be honest, they um they've got this you know the the focus on China is a volatile one because you just don't know what's going to happen when you wake up tomorrow with the the focus on China, but it's growing quickly in in that market, and it's it's got the kind of like the optionality of the U.S. market, which is you know very competitive, but it's got that global diversification. Um, the company. You know, seems to be guiding for a positive outlook in the year ahead with, they, they said, high single-digit revenue growth and EBITDA margin improvement. So pretty positive outlook. Um, if you adjust for cash, so it's $4.2 billion market cap. You adjust for cash, you're down to about $3.5 billion on $1.4 billion of sales. Um, that gives you some context around, I guess, the business and its valuation. I would just say, I would say that A2Milk was kind of the, the poster child. I think Bloomberg ranked it as the best performing stock in the world at one stage. And that's when you sell usually. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a little while ago. I would just say, you know, just be very mindful of where A2 Milk finds itself in the industry. So I'd have it as a very small position in a portfolio if I had it in a portfolio, um, simply because the the Australian market is going backwards. The Chinese market is going forwards quickly. But to get to China, A2 milk requires so much greasing of the palms. Um, to, uh, it's Are incredible. Suggesting? <laughs> it's incredible, mate. Like It's just incredible. When you look behind the scenes. Um, the who, Daigu channels and the, yeah. Not even that so much. It's more like the, yeah, that too. But like the... Who owns what? You know, like they bought this Matura Valley business, this manufacturing site. Well, that's controlled by the same Chinese group that gives A2 Milk the license to go into China. <laughs> so, yeah. it's a trading so, stock. It's a trade. It's a speculated <laughs> stock. Yeah. Yeah. And so, basically, what happens is, you know, A2 Milk finds itself in the middle of this cluster of Chinese state-backed organizations that have to like that it has to negotiate with and get through. And that's why when we had the trade war, I can't remember who it was, uh, someone from A2 Milk basically distanced themselves and said, oh, no, we're a Kiwi company. Um, and so, <laughs> yeah, it just it just be mindful of that. Like we saw that risk of it um, come to reality a few, few years ago. So um, if it pays off, it's going to pay off very well. But if it, um, if it, you know, if if we have some issues geopolitically, it might become a problem. Um, so I think for a small part in a portfolio, why not? But uh, just be aware of the risks. That's all I'd say. Cool, mate. That's A2 Milk. What's next on your list? Uh, the perfect inflation hedge. Oh. Infrastructure, toll roads. 
Um, but no one's driving <laughs> anymore. <laughs> the roads are empty. You'd be surprised. Every time I get on the road, I think you have to add 30 minutes to anything you do in Melbourne at the moment. Yeah, that's uh, been pretty crazy. Peak hours like between two and eight now. Um, <laughs> uh, Atlas Arteria is so ALX is the code. Uh, there's a bit of interesting stuff behind it. So IFM Investors, which invests on behalf of the industry super funds, owns about 15% of the company. Uh, everyone was expecting them to make a bid to take it private. Um, hmm. There's this big difference between what a private investor like an industry fund is willing to pay for it toll road that they can manage versus what the listed market is mm. um which is quite strange but you know if you're private you can have more debt on it you can be more patient you can make changes sure. um but the stock jumped so they own toll roads in france and the us i won't try and pronounce any of them <laughs> mm. <laughs> the, i think traffic surprise on the upside so in france apparently favorable ski conditions were central to a recovery in traffic <laughs> uh, so cold weather to you know tourism picking up COVID restrictions finishing, you know, coming off a very low base. It's like when I, uh, I think it was IFM bought or the consortium bought um, Sydney Airport recently. So the the price is still somewhat depressed. So any positive news contributes to a, you know, a, a reasonably strong jump. Um, yeah. And there's different ways that obviously different ways to make money out of toll roads. One is that your uh, payments or your tolls are usually linked to inflation. So every six months or every year, the government essentially, apart, as part of a contract, will increase it by a minimum of a certain amount. And usually that's linked to CPI, which obviously CPI is going crazy at the moment. Mm. Um, and one of the other ways is vehicle mix. So if you get um, more trucks on the road versus motorbikes or cars uh, on your on your freeways or your toll roads, then you get paid more. So um, traffic was up 23% on the main French uh, assets. NPAT went up to, or profit was up to 117 million. Guidance was for another 20 cents per share in distributions. Uh, and the company kind of keeps expanding and improving. So they'll negotiate for more concessions for more toll roads, or they'll add a new lane or um, add new entries or exits. Uh, it's one of the ways that they continue to make money. So quite, an, I think it was quite an impressive one. The market liked it on the day, given mm -hmm. what else was happening on the day when everything else was selling off. Um but there's always questions around bond yields and the value of infrastructure assets. Yeah, it's uh, analysts are still just having a quick look here and ticker. Analysts are forecasting very strong uh, dividend growth into the future. That's kind of how I look at it. This would you, when you look at a company or, or an infrastructure play like this, how do you like? What are the metrics that you look at? Uh, leverage. I always look at leverage because I'm always worried something bad is going to happen. Um, yep. And a risk with these things isn't the bond yield and the valuation, but rather the cost of debt going up and the cost of debt eating into your profitability. Yeah. Um, and then, I mean, they're always going to look expensive. So you want to know the how secure the income is and how, how hedged it is against inflation. But it's usually, it should be bond-like if you think about it. You've got an 80-year asset that's paying off dividends or, or income mm. um, so they do tend to because people are looking for income they do tend to oscillate on pretty big PEs yeah um, right which is it, always something to be wary of it has bounced back a bit uh, since COVID it's been pretty strong like performer overall hasn't it did this was this owned <clears throat> pardon me at one stage did you say was this owned by Macquarie Atlas Roads it was called yeah Macquarie Atlas yeah, thought so. Okay, makes sense. Cool. That's uh, ALX is the ticker symbol. It's on the ASX. Um, and do you have that in portfolios, in model portfolios? Or? No, we don't. We tend to use either a, an index or an active manager to get diversified infrastructure exposure. Yeah. yeah, fair enough. Okay, so that's that's great. My next company is Fortescue. So Fortescue, um, it's pretty quick to sum up. Uh, revenue went backwards 22%. There's a 4% increase in iron ore. Uh, but the cost that they received per ton of iron ore went down quite dramatically. It fell from $135 a ton to $99 a ton. So that's, you know, quite a substantial uh, retraction. So that's why revenue fell, you know, at the end of the, at the, at the, end of the day. Cyclical stock. Yeah. Revenue is uh, P times Q, you know, price you receive uh, times the quantity you produce. So um, when the price falls dramatically, that's what happens. Add profit down 40% to 6.2 billion. Uh, dividends for the full year of $2.07 fully franked. It's a final dividend of $1.21, uh, which is down from $2.11 last year. Still great for Twiggy Forest. 
How many billion was that? Yeah. Was that yeah. three and a half billion they reported in the paper? Yeah, probably something like that. I, I just remember seeing the dividends last year. I remember it was something like an interim dividend of over $2 billion. And I was thinking, <laughs> wow, incredible Imagine the stuff. tax on that. Oh, wow. Uh, maybe it's in a and Frank charitable Reddit. trust. <laughs> yeah. uh, Outlook, uh, the company you know, said it expects basically flat production with costs slightly higher. Costs were higher because diesel prices went way up. And also because labor and some of the consumables in the iron ore trade went up as well. So there's kind of that cost push in there. Um, so over the the year, I think the the C1 cost, which is the cost, the cash cost at the mine site, like to dig um, iron ore out of ground, it doesn't include uh, things like head office expenses, administration, marketing, all that sort of stuff, like just actual costs at the mine site were $15.90 per ton. That's a wet ton. Uh, so... The company does have its uh, future industries business, which is kind of the push on uh, green hydrogen. Fantastic uh, speeches by Twiggy Forrest, Dr. Twiggy Forrest, I could say. Um, if you want to find them, they're called the Boyer speeches. or um, You know, the Boyer speech by Twiggy Forrest is fantastic. So um, <clears throat> the company is pursuing a pretty aggressive decarbonization too, which is positive you know, they're moving to renewable energies and trying to uh, roll out things like trucks and trains that are, you know, fully renewable. So uh, if they can pull that off, it'd be a fantastic step for the industry as well as the company. So Fortescue overall, pretty good result. Analysts are forecasting lower uh, dividends in the near term. So that's just a reflection of that iron ore price coming down a bit. And at the end of the day, that's the unpredictable factor. The outlook for commodity prices, in particular iron ore, Looks robust, but you probably wouldn't say it was like it was, you know, the last three or four years. So, um, yeah, yeah. The business- people yeah, tend to extrapolate it. anything BHP, Rio, Fortescue, because everyone's short term focused, they extrapolate short term, you know, $135 per ton mm. um, iron ore sales for an extended period of time. Um, so, I think it's always going to be it's cyclical by its very nature. So, if, absolutely, if interest rate hikes are going to impact on economic growth generally you're going to need less steel and iron ore mm. um, and prices should fall. So there's an old saying that uh, maybe it's not an old saying, but <laughs> make it up, but you want to buy mining companies when the PE is high, because it usually means that the, it means the, the earnings are depressed earnings have depressed um, mm. and you sell them when the PE is low. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I, they've got, quite a few billion dollars of debt on their balance sheet, $6.1 billion, and they got $5.2 billion of cash. Yeah. I would love to see Ford Skew without debt, you know, for the first time in its life. It's always been leveraged and it's always been seemingly binary. If you took the debt out of the equation, I mean, I'm sure there's a reason for it. I haven't looked Free money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I just feel like without debt, it would it's like significantly de-risk the business. I get it can sustain it now, but... um. I just love to see that business without debt. It'll just give it optionality and, you know, a lot of breathing space. So uh, that's Fortescue. Over to you, mate. This one uh, is difficult for me because I've made money and lost money. Probably probably end up breaking even on this one. It was late last week. So Zip, Zipco. Oh, yep. um, I was one of those people who bought it at like 50 cents and then sold it at six and then bought it back at four and sold it at 10 and then bought it at six and yep. still hold it at. 90 cents. <laughs> um, I think um, there's more comment. Like the numbers are fantastic. Like any anyone would pay for, the, you should be willing to pay for the kind of growth they're delivering. You know, transactions are up 62% in the US. Uh, transaction volumes up 67% to 4 billion. Um, revenues up 70% in the US. Like it's just incredible growth on all their businesses, albeit off a low base. Uh, it's just the massive challenge they have. Of, you've had cheap access to capital for a long time and they're able to turn the capital over. This is what buy now, pay later business, obviously. Mm. They're able to turn that capital over quite consistently. Uh, but the issue they've had, one is valuations of technology companies, the ability to uh, raise capital. Um, and the other one was a jump in credit losses. So when you're doing buy now, pay later, if you have reason, they're, they're, they guided for less than 2%, but they had more than that in the last few years, it actually wipes out all of your profit. Even 2% on a transact, you know, average transaction value in the billions is quite a large amount. Mm. Um, 
So some of the quotes, um, I couldn't imagine running this company at the moment. I think Afterpay sold to Block at the right time. Uh, was, as we look back on the past 12 months, it's clear the world is vastly different than when we started. Uh, mm-hmm. And then you go to normal, the normal commentary you get. So there's some right sizing of the global cost base. That generally means cutting staff. Mm-hmm. Um, and I want to share that we've already delivered a number of initiatives to reduce cash burn, manage credit losses and improve essentially cost economics. So they're trying to lend more to better people uh, and do it quicker. <laughs> yep. Because yep. obviously if you can cycle that capital quicker, you can... Yep. You can, even though your your annual cost of debt might be, you know, I don't know, I don't know what it is in this case, might be ten percent, five percent, whatever it is, I don't know. Um, you can cycle that capital quicker and quicker. You can actually earn more of a return from your your customers. It's um, they've got this medium term target, uh, which is pretty seems pretty robust of a net transaction market uh, margin between two point five and three percent. So could you know, I, I guess if we, if they could pull it off, maybe they can they can execute pretty like they can show some pretty meaningful upside. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's always going to be sentiment driven with the share price, which you know you'd think it's worth more than what ninety cents, and that's why it's the most volatile stock on the market at the moment. Mm, yeah, it's down a massive way, isn't it? Since, like you said, since those highs. So, um, not so... in portfolios, but in my portfolio. <laughs> <laughs> Taking one for the team here. I, I put in the A two milk <laughs> mask, basket. I think. Yeah, it's a uh, yeah. I would yeah. I mean, out of A two milk and Zip, I don't know. I feel like. They both have, if they can pull it off, they're going to have meaningful upside in massive markets. Yeah. But um, you, you just <clears throat> got to go into these things with your eyes open and just be aware of the risks. Um, it's, it's yeah, I think A2, I mean, after they being hidden inside block now is, is interesting because it makes it a bit harder to get proper comps. But um, the, it seems like the, the when Zip backed away from that deal with Sezzle, the market loved that. And I think it does show that it, uh, the company is trying to, as you say, right size, but it's trying to focus on its core markets now, which is pretty impressive. So, and it's important for it to do now. It's kind of thrown everything at the wall. Now it knows what sticks. Let's just stick with that, which is, seems like the way to go. So it's zip uh, to get a symbol ZIP. Yeah, so it's much easier now. They got rid of the one in there. That was oh, always yeah. typing that in. <laughs> oh yeah. Anyway, yeah. it was super annoying. So thanks, Larry. That was great. <laughs> And the thing is, I think when you do the the, the dollar sign on on uh, Twitter, when you do the uh, the ticker symbol, um, I don't think it works when you put numbers in. I could be mistaken. Okay, so at number four for me is uh, Alcidian. I'll be quick. Small cap company, spoken about a lot. Um, it's a fan favorite for anyone that's on straw man too. Uh, Alcidian reported pretty strong results, uh, thirty four million dollars. And we already knew all this because they released their uh, Q four, but. Revenue of $34 million up 33%. Recurring revenue up 42% to $23 million. Um, there was a 96% increase in the uh, contract sold. So during the year, which is a huge, huge amount of uh, revenue to be banked in the future. Underlying EBITDA of $0.9 million. Um, that's up from 0.4, I believe, or negative 0.4. I don't have the numbers in front of me. Uh Gross margin declined slightly just as they shift the mix. So Alcidian actually sells third-party software along with its software. And so when it sells that software, it doesn't have the same margin, obviously. So uh, dividends, no dividends, but it does have cash of $17.3 million on its balance sheet. So it's got a pretty rock-solid balance sheet considering it's just turned into um, basically slight profitability or cash flow break even. The outlook... The company, this is where it's really interesting because it sells software to hospitals, particularly in the UK. Uh, Alcidian has already banked nearly the same amount of revenue that it earned this uh, last year for this year when it entered yeah. the new financial year. So um, basically anything that adds from here is growth. Um, they've recently you know, recruited very well. Um, the, the, the UK, the NHS wants to make, I think, 90% of NHS trusts digital by December 2023. So that's 18 months or 12 to 18 months. So it is go time for Alcidian over the next 12 to 18 months. It's going to have to sell a lot more uh, software because it wants to get into those hospitals before they go digital because as soon as they've already got their software packages, they're not going to just up and change to, to Alcidian. So um, we've made a few acquisitions along the way. Kate Quirk, CEO, um, not the founder of Alcidian, but a founder of one of the businesses that was acquired. You know, does a very good job. So, 
I think El Cidian, it fell recently during COVID. It got way ahead of itself. Um, and I think, you know, it's a small cap company. So go in with your eyes open, please. It's you know going to be volatile. But I think for the most part, it's a really high quality, soon to be very profitable, small cap company on the ASX. So the ticker symbol is ALC. Uh, that's El Cidian. Uh, and that's it from me. That's my number four, mate. It yeah, massively required in, in healthcare too. My wife's a, a doctor. I won't yeah. say too much. But, um, <laughs> there's you know, even look during the pandemic. You remember we heard about you know contact tracing being mm. fac- faxed, like yeah. faxed. The fact that faxes are still used in some places is incredible. You know, we've got an app on our computer that can fax, and people are still using fax machines. So yeah, I think there's a massive market if they. But as you said, you have to be super aggressive and and win market share quickly. I think. Yeah, and that's what they're doing. They've got they can ride on the coattails of some of their deals that they've already won. So, yeah. um, as hospitals around the world go to digital, it's huge Fire tailwind. Market. Yeah. yeah. Cool. My last one, sticking with wealth management again. Um, I think I've done every pla- we've done every platform almost, apart from yeah, hub, well, panorama, and yep. um, the other one. So <laughs> they're for sale. You don't want to review them at the moment. <laughs> um, premium. So PPS, uh, probably the best managed account or uh, SMA or one of the more popular platforms for that. Mm-hmm. So similar to Hub Twenty Four, Net Wealth, you can hold. Yeah, advisors use them to hold assets and get consolidated reporting, but they're also quite popular in the managed account space. So where advisors are taking discretion to manage client portfolios, mm-hmm. um, benefited from the same trend. So advisors leaving uh, big groups like the old banks and insurance companies to to start their own practices. Um, smaller, I think smaller market share than the other, than Hub24 and NetWealth, but growing quickly. So record net inflows. 2.9 billion for the financial year, up 90% record profit. When they say in the results that it's a large, they don't even say the percentage, it's a large amount. The profit was up, I think, more than 100 times, probably because it was so low. 3,100%. 3, I just said 1,000. I was <laughs> just say that. Um, and how do you, yeah. So it was, and I, it's, once again, it's kind of like El City and where you get, as soon as you get scale, these are essentially tech businesses. So once they get scale and profitability, it just keeps growing and growing. As soon as you, every client you put on is almost more profitable. So mm. revenue was up 22, earnings up 21. Uh, they sold, they had a couple of random businesses. One of, they sold one to Morningstar. So they're international operations. Um, and essentially they're getting, flows into every part of their business at the moment mm. and the good thing is like if, even though we're going through a very choppy part of time in markets you can see like you said overall platform flows 2.9 billion it, and the market went backwards 1.8 billion so if you're looking at flows probably don't look at that right now you probably want to look at is uh, sorry not just flows but like you, you want to look at the overall mix and see how fast the platform is adding money not yeah. necessarily uh, the market movement or the total amount of money on the platform because yes they might not be monetizing as effectively but sooner or later you know that stock markets and all markets are going to come back and when they do all of that money that they're adding now will be worth more in the future so and you want yeah. to look at the uh, the advisory groups they're setting up um with as well. So they basically they go out and sign advisors to their platform. Mm. Uh, so they, as long as they're growing advisors, um, I think is is key there. Mm. Um, they've been quite, uh, one of the differences, we obviously reviewed all of them at one point. One of the key differences was their average balance, particularly with the power app business they bought, um, mm. is significantly higher than net wealth, Hub24 and most of the other majors. So why is that? A, they're quite good at alternative investments. So, you know, private equity, venture capital, and dealing with the complexity and reporting of those. So the more more high net worth uh, advisors use them as their platform of choice. Right. Okay. So that's interesting because net wealth always bangs on about being for high net worth clients and whatever. So um, Sorry. interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Don't call. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's interesting. So would you, would you buy it today? Like if, uh, well, there's premium hub and net wealth. You're in a financial advisor. You've got experience with these products. Do you like any of them, all of them, none of them? Uh, I think the the multiples on the other two are almost too high, but then premiums is much smaller um, market cap, 350 million. Yeah. Um, the 
Premium had a takeover offer. I think it was from NetWealth that has kind yeah. of disappeared, yeah. Um, yeah. which is a that's the kind of challenge we have there. Um, as a trader, I'd probably be doing PPS, um, and then yeah. at some point, NetWealth or Hub Twenty Four. You could just yeah. have small allocations to each if you like the platform sector. Yeah, I think as an overall pie, it's super valuable, and um, they've got to capture space now that everyone's leaving the banks. And uh, yeah, it's interesting because in this space, if you if you monitor the market, I know Raymond Jang does, who co-hosts the show with me every now and again. He um, he has a spreadsheet which tracks the market share of all of the players, not just the listed companies. And um, Macquarie's platform is actually growing rapidly as well, which is kind of like this pillar that no one really notices. So that's um, that's premium, PPS. Maybe we can do a deep dive on platforms in the future, but um, good one, mate. So my final one is uh, Dubba, D-U-B is the ticker symbol. Uh, absolute dog of results. Uh, so <laughs> the company... Didn't even I, I did a tweet about this, so apologies if you've seen that. But um, yeah, the company came out um, and basically, let's just have a look. It, in it for example, in its um, investor presentation, it basically said that in FY22 reported a net operating loss of forty six million dollars or thereabouts. That was down from a loss of twenty one million dollars, but that excluded share based compensation, which was around about twenty billion dollars. Uh, so in actual fact, if you read the unaudited set of results uh it was 65 billion dollar loss and that was on revenue of 35 million dollars so um yeah it, so there was a 15.3 percent a 15.3 million dollar increase in revenue for a 47 million dollar increase in costs and expenses so um the tech so- company it's it was fine two years ago and now it's you know it's on the nose because of that isn't it yeah severe cash burn um Severe cash burn. So the the company uh, does call recording. So if you if you've ever heard when you call the bank, this call is being monitored for quality and compliance purposes. Uh, th- that's the kind of software that they do, and they they try to sign up um, networks, so like Telstra, British Telecom, so on and so forth, and then customers of that. So say like if BHP uses Telstra, BHP can use Dubber technology because they use Telstra as a uh, carrier network and that's basically what they do um they've got over half a million subscribers uh they say to their uh technology but there isn't one there isn't a, i can't find genuine reviews uh of this of, of the technology and they never report arpu so revenue per per user yeah. um feels like that, a time you want to be a private company if you're in tech and trying to grow to be honest i would say that's true true unless you need money unless (laughs) unless you want to pay yourself an exorbitant amount of money and you need to issue yourself zero exercise price options so this (laughs) so issuing options to employees when they don't cost anything um is i it's beyond me you know how like (laughs) Um, so we had for, Kogan a year or two ago, wasn't it? Uh, but now the options are out of the money. Everyone was worried about them getting cheap, cheap shares, and now the options are out of the money. But if the the key point is, I guess, if you have zero exercise price, <laughs> doesn't matter what the shit price is, as long as yeah. it's over one cent. <laughs> so, um, so, uh, I think so, you're gonna get you're gonna get a call this week. Um, so yeah. Uh, anyway, I'll keep it short and sweet. Um, I you know, I've, I originally recommended Dubber um, and sold it after that. It's just too many red flags in the latest report. So for me, it's a pass. Um, and that's Dubber. D-U-B is a ticker symbol. I know a lot of investors are very confident on it. And if it can you know, turn its subscribers uh, into paying subscribers, keep them growing, it could experience a lot of revenue upside and the cost could mellow out. Um, I hope that's the case. Uh, and I hope that... Uh, the company kind of gets more, I like guess, a bit tighter with its belt around that um, that uh, share based compensation. Because the thing, the thing about share based compensation is you're giving away permanent equity for something that is not permanent. So when you give away equity in a company, that equity stays there forever unless you do a share buyback, right? Which is different to paying someone a wage, which is just like you pay it, it's done, it moves through the system. If they're no good, you get rid of them done 
But with equity, you give it away permanently. And so that's why I, we always say, like, look at that share count to make sure that the companies aren't just issuing shares uh, for not and not getting the return. So maybe in the next year, like the company could continue to compound rapidly. I think just be mindful if you look at the revenue of the company, just be mindful of how much of it was acquisitions. I couldn't quite get a read on it, but I think most of the revenue that they earn is acquired revenue. Yeah. Uh, um, so yeah, that's uh, WDVB. So just to reflect on our list today, Drew had Ramsey Healthcare, Wes Farmers, uh, ALX, which is uh, Atlas Arteria, uh, Zip and Premium PPS. I had A2 Milk RPM Global, which is RUL, the ticker symbol, Fortescue, Alcidian, and Dubba. So some great companies in there. Um, some really interesting results. And it's good that I, I, I just love it, Drew, that you bring names that people know and pay fully frank dividends and all the rest of it. So I went um, a couple of small caps this time. So yeah, well, you got premium and you got zip. Yeah. So zip's a small cap now. Yep, it is now. <laughs> yeah. So, um, <laughs> My pocket super fun knows. But I see it everywhere. I see zip everywhere. I know a lot of people that use it. So um, really interesting business. It's kind of like in the hearts and minds of people already in that mind share, which is so difficult to get. So mate, um, like I said, we, we will come back. If you have questions, you can send them through by using that uh, that link in the podcast player. You can find Drew at waddlepartners.com.au, financial planner, certified financial planner, based here in Melbourne, but has clients all over Australia. Uh, and you'll find more of the podcasts on rask.com.au or raskmedia.com.au. Drew, thanks for joining me, mate. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks again. Looking forward to next year. Thanks for listening to the Australian Investors Podcast, which is proudly supported by JP Morgan Asset Management. JP Morgan Asset Management provides opportunities to strengthen and diversify investment portfolios through alternative income strategies with the JP Morgan Equity Premium Income ETF, or ASX JEPI, J-E-P-I, currently the world's largest active ETF with assets under management of US $25.49 billion dollars as at the 16th of May, 2023. For more information, you can visit the JP Morgan Asset Management website by visiting am.jpmorgan.com slash au. That's am.jpmorgan.com slash au.